In the chapters dealing with electric field, we have seen how an electric field will create a force on charges. And then at the same time, charges are the source of electric fields. In the last chapter, we dealt with how the magnetic field create forces on a moving charge in the form of F equals QV cross B. So you might also imagine that a moving charge also creates magnetic field. And in fact, it does. Um, this is, of course, what's known as the the Biot-Savart law, which is kind of the equivalent of Coulomb's law for magnetic fields. Some moving charge is going to create some amount of magnetic field at a certain point in space. The former looks a little more complicated just because with the cross product here, the direction ends up a little funnier because of the nature of the magnetic fields. And then the constant out front has this particular form. Where this R here is the displacement, well technically that's a unit vector for that displacement, from your charge to your point. Just like in the electric field case, but of course now we have to do this cross product to reflect the cross product nature of the force itself. This mu naught is known as the permeability of free space. Once again, just some constant with respect to magnetic field. However, uh, it has been so defined based on the units of our Tesla and Coulombs, etc. The unit works out quite exactly to be 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 units being newtons per amp square. And as long as you use coulombs, meters per second, meters, you get Tesla in the end. We can also extend this to moving current because we saw that we can replace this with IL. So we can also likewise replace this with IL. And that's what we'll be using for this question. Moreover, because the direction really matters here, not only do we have to track how the displacement vector changes for every single point, oftentimes you also have to also track which way the current is pointing at every single point. And so usually we have to do some kind of integration when the wire is not completely straight. So let's see how this works in the context of this particular question. Here we have two long wires and they both have current I through it. And we want to find out the magnitude at this particular point based on all the currents and all the wires because as we've talked about, moving charges slash current create magnetic fields. And given the funny shapes that's happening here, it's probably useful to cut this up into a few pieces. So we'll call this segment one, segment two, segment three. And then over here we have the whole wire that we can treat basically the same way, segment four. And so let's deal with one segment at a time then. For segment one, we need to cut this up into a tiny little piece, call that DL, going in that direction for the I, and P is somewhere down here. The displacement vector is from here to here, that's your R. And if we define my XYZ, XY right-hand corner system Z coming out, we can say that IDL is just I dy in the j hat, positive. Whereas my r hat is clearly going to be negative j hat for every single point along this wire. So when you do this cross product, you see that we'll get zero because j cross j is exactly zero. So then for sigma one, there is no magnetic field at that particular point. The same thing goes for sigma three because it's just kind of the reverse and the point is up there, so then there's your R. So then it's still J cross J, so then B3 is also zero. So we'll put that up here so we can remember that while getting myself more space to do the second part. So the second part has a semi-circular arc and we're cutting it up into little chunks that looks like that. And whenever we have a circle, especially since we're dealing with a point at the center of the circle, it's often useful to look at this DL here as a R D theta, where theta, just for the sake of easiness, we're going to define theta in the standard position in this case. So all the way from the positive x axis, we'll call that theta. So then our limits of integration will be pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. 
You can do it in other ways, but I just find this easier for me to set up the direction properly. The current here goes in this direction. And so let's do the hard work of finding out what is my displacement vector for any given point. In standard position, so this point is our starting point, so our vector points inwards like that towards the point where we're measuring, so that's my r. So that's going to be 0 minus the position of this point, and because we're using standard position, if we just use r cosine theta in the i plus r sine theta in the j, the positive negative sign will be taken care of by the fact that this theta here is greater than 9 degrees and less than 180 degrees. Just to double check, in that quadrant, cosine should be negative, which in fact it is, and sine is positive, which in fact it is. Even if we move down here, then the cosine now becomes it's still negative, and the sine is also negative, and all that works out. So then my r expression becomes negative r cosine theta in the i hat minus r sine theta in the j hat which then also helps us define my unit vector. Of course, the length of this vector is just simply r, or you can see that sine squared plus cosine squared is simply 1, so it factors out. So next, we got to specify the direction of dl, which goes in the direction of the current. Now here, this one is a little more tricky because it's 90 degrees to that position that we were at. First of all, we of course know that the length of dl is r d theta, but then to specify the direction, it goes in this direction. And just to keep things consistent, we should use the same kind of angle. So at this point, we expect an angle greater than 90. So we're going to actually define the angle from here over so that this theta is the same as this theta, so that we're consistent when we do our integral. So what we need there is we need for a theta between 90 and 180 to give us a j component that is positive as well as a x component that is positive. Of course, we know from our sine and cosine graphs. So let's just do these graphs really quickly here. So this is, let's do cosine. And because of the way the 90 degree angle works here, the cosine is actually going to give us the y component. For the y component, we're down here, which is negative. So we can't have that, so we have to make it positive by introducing a negative sign. While my sine theta looks like this, and it's still positive for this part, so we're fine here. We can keep that as positive in the i. Just to double check, if we're down here, the angle is this big, so we're in the third quadrant, where we have a negative for the cosine, and we want to end up having a positive j hat component, that's why the negative sign still works. Minus a negative gives you a positive. And for the third quadrant here for the sine, where we over here, we'll get a negative number, which in fact does give me a negative in the x. So this is the correct expression given these definition here. Proceed slowly and carefully when we deal with these directions, and it is a little tricky. So it's good to go ahead and check each quadrant as to what's going on. Now that we've done all that, we can finally put it in to my db, or we can speed ahead and even write out the integral. Limits integration, of course, goes from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. And what do we have? We have the constants, which can, of course, come out. Current, same for all the points dl is r d theta, r being the same for every single point as well. We have sine theta i minus cosine theta j, cross with minus cosine theta i minus sine theta j, all over my r square, which is just r square. Let's get a little more space here. So then my b, bunch of stuff comes out, as well as we can take care of the cross product. So i r and r squared just leaves me with a r underneath. And then evaluating the cross product, we get i cross i gives you nothing, i cross j positive k, so we have negative sine square theta in the k hat direction. And then we have cosine j cross i, which gives you negative k, negative negative. So that's three negatives, making it negative cosine square 
in the k hat direction. And then we have j cross j, which gives you nothing. d theta. This, of course, you know this, it's basically negative sine squared plus cos squared. That's a 1. So then we can replace this with simply negative 1 k hat, which we can actually take out. The integral ends up being nice and simple for this kind of cases. Negative k hat. And we're left with just theta, basically, which is 3 pi over 2 minus pi over 2, which is basically pi. I guess we can cancel the pi underneath, and we get that. This you might recognize as similar to a derived result from the book when we did a single current loop, and at the center of that. You're certainly welcome to use that in the future, but I do want to show you in general how we deal with the various direction of my displacement vector as well as my little current element and the direction thereof. So that allows us to write that b2 is equal to some negative number in the k hat direction. And so now we move on to section 4. In section 4, we have a long wire. In fact, that's the unknown that we have there because we're actually solving for a for the separation. But what we do know is that the sum of all these must give you 0 with the vector sign, of course. These guys are 0. So then, because we know b2 is negative k, b4 must be positive k of the same amount. And because it has to be positive k, that will help us decide which way the current's going to flow in the other wire, which is actually the second part of the question. So given that the magnetic field must go in the positive k, we can work backwards from this cross product to find out what delta i must be in. Because we know by symmetry, we only have to consider this middle point because any point down here will, will have the vertical component or the y component cancel out with a point up there. So really, it's just this displacement that we're caring about. So we know it goes in the negative uh, x direction. Given that dl cross r gives you my f, so we basically have, in my case, the middle finger and the index finger already. So we can use that to orientate my thumb, which is the current direction. So after having done all that, I, I must conclude that my i must go up. So dl is in the positive j hat direction. Now, since we also do long wire so often, there's a bit of a shortcut of a right hand rule where we can use our thumb to be in the current direction, and then the curl of my finger is the direction of the magnetic field. It still works out around that wire. The two rules that we have given you, they give consistent answer, it's just whichever one's easier. So if we had done that, we try to wrap our fingers around the wire such that as we go from underneath the wire, we have to come out. So that must mean that your thumb pointing upward, so then again, your current is going to go up. So whichever one is easier for you in any given situation, you can use either of the right-hand rules. The magnitude itself for a long wire, you could go through the whole integration bit. But again, because we do it so often, we're basically given the size of the magnetic field, which is that. And you can read through the relevant chapters in your textbook to, to find out where that comes from. But for our purposes, just because the direction is a little peskier to work with a magnetic field, we can rely on the these derivers out a little bit more. What you do see is that the further away you are from your wire, the magnetic field decreases uh, in this 1 over r kind of relationship. So now given two expressions for b4, we can equate them, which is equal to the opposite of b2. And of course, they both go in the positive k direction as designed. We chose the current such that that happened. Bunch of things cancel out. And we're left with that a must be equal to that, given that they have the same current. So there's the answer for the first part. And the answer for the second part where we dealt with is that the current must go upwards. So a demonstration of the Biot-Savart law for moving charges, well, really, in this case, little bits of current as we cut it up into small little pieces because the direction of the current matters as much as the direction of that displacement vector. And putting together all the integrals 
and equating things to find out what we need. 